Good afternoon. My name is Donovan Carter. Uh, today is October 22nd. It's a little past 1240. And we are here in Bradenton, Florida. I'm with the Sammy Pops Oil History Program. And I'm joined by... Ronan Hart. Adolfo Romero. And today, like I said, we're in Bradenton, Florida at the Back to Angola Festival here. Um, and who do we have the pleasure of interviewing today? We'll start with... I'm Sharona Woodside Bar. I'm from Red Base, North Andros. Okay. I'm Kendrick Wallace. I'm from Red Base, North Andros. Peggy Colbrooks from Red Base, North Andros. Wow. Thank you guys so much for all, uh, joining us here today. Pleasure. Um, so, my first question: You guys all said you guys were, you know, born in Red Bay and Andros, right? Yes, sir. So, can you tell us a little bit about what? island life was like? None of us grew up on an island, so can you tell us what it's like? Island life is sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's natural. It's all natural. Um, I think it dates back. I would definitely say it dates back to our ancestral history, where we were taught to live from the land and the sea um, as a family one big family in a community. So, yeah, as we say, island life is sweet. Yeah. Uh, growing up in Red Bay, um, we went to the sea a lot, went swimming with each other, uh, went fishing, went digging crabs, you know, doing fun stuff. Um, actually, I learned a trade from my, from my um, daddy, Henry Wallace, how to do wood carving. So I used to do that on my spare time. Mm. And sometime also I used to scale fish for lunch money mm -hmm. <laughs> to make my lunch money. And I life is very sweet. Everybody live as family, you know. Mm -hmm. And we um we grew up um farming our own stuff. We never really went outside, never had no jobs like that. So we normally eat off the land in Red Base. Um Additionally to that, um, my cousin Peggy, to the, to the right of me, like the other females in the community, because the majority of the males in the community would do fishing, sponging, and hunting. That was a way to provide for their families. The females would stay home, do the farming, and um, the basket weaving that was handed down from our ancestors, particularly um, Miss O'Meal and Marshall, who would have taught everyone else in the community to weave her and um, O'Lion or Scrap Iron, as you would have probably uh, known him to be. Wow. Yeah. Um, wow. <clears throat> so, you, you know, you guys mentioned schooling. What did schooling look like? What did you guys learn about? What Did you guys learn about kind of how was history of Red Bays and of Andrews taught? Well, these two would have to better answer that because um, as a child growing up in Red Bays, during the nine months the school were held between September and June, um, because B.A. Newton was my adopted, was my father's adopted father, and so we never spent the school months, my sisters and brothers and I, we never spent the school months in Red Bays. We were shipped off to Mastic Point mm. um, because Red Bays had an all-age school where Mastic Point didn't have an all-age school. We went from grades one through grade mm -hmm. seven there. Mm -hmm. So um, the better part of the schooling in Red Bays and how it was done in the one room wooden school, they would have a better mm. knowledge of that. Um, I went to Red Bays primary um, from one to six. Um, school in there, it was really nice, but going to school in Red Bay, we never really had a school bus to pick us up and drop us to school, so everybody in the community normally walks to school like a couple miles away from home, but it was very fun. School, they, they normally teach us farming. We used to do, um, they teach us how to play sport, basketball, we did track and field. Um, they teach us science, um, language, maths, all the basics. When some really smart kids came out of Red Bay and yeah. gifted children. Yeah, you can tell them about school. <laughs> Our school is one small, was one small mm. place. We used to have to walk there. Then when we reached the we'd be there. If the rain come down, we stay inside until the rain over and then we finish walk on. Go to back to our several homes. Mm. Yeah. Um, during the time, there was one teacher and his wife, Reverend B.A. Newton, um, 
and his wife, Rose Newton. They taught from grades one through grade six. He was also the local preacher of Salem Baptist Church. That was the only yes. church in Red Bays during that time. Mm -hmm. And so what, uh, what education the kids were taught there um, came through him and maybe the missionaries that would have come around to, yeah, to do some teaching in the communities. Wow, that's very cool. Extremely cool. You have no idea. <laughs> so in the community, what, what kind of community events were happening? Did you guys have anything like festivals or, or holidays? Or what, what was it that brought the community together in that way? Um, we, in Red Bays, we have a, a festival called Snapper, Snapper Tournament. All the fishermen go out and compete who catch the most fish, the then uh, the largest fish, then you get a prize. Then we have uh, news reporters at the dock. When you come in, they'll, they'll interview everybody, and uh, everybody on the boat, take pictures of the fish. So it's be really nice. Then the school, we normally do house sports also. Mm -hmm. So we have different houses. You have Yellow Ella, Ponciana, and Ibiscus. These are uh, flowers, national flowers, and trees of the Bahamas. We name uh, the houses after the national yeah. flowers and the trees. Yeah. Um. In addition to the Snapper Fest, what we did, also we did the playing marble, the hopscotch, playing um, bat and ball, all of these things are younger kids um, growing up in the community of Red Bays. Basket weaving was a huge thing. You, that was something that was mandatory to learn for the females. And um, also the sponging, like I said, and the fishing, it was mandatory for the males to learn those along with Kendrick's dad who did um, wood carving. You know, so yeah, like I said, um, we learned from farming Miss Marshall and Pastor Newton, um, their granddad, and the rest of the elder, uh, the elders in the community. My favorite grandfather, Henry Cobra, mm -hmm. <laughs> would take us to the field, and what we would call the old yard, and um, they teach us to plant corn, peas, cassava, sweet potato, and dig those up. Learn to make the rush bread like what Wilton was talking about from the cassava, learning to squeeze it, um, grater it and all of that, separate the middle, the top, and the other part of it. So it was, it was really, really cool. Favorite meals growing up as a child was roasting corn <laughs> on the fire outside, yeah, and the sweet potato, putting those over the fire and roasting them, just eating it like that. So it was cool. The palm touch plant going into the forest, so into um, the pine yard, pulling that out, just the heart or the stalk of that, and eating that. So as a child, um, by the time we left in the morning to go out and play and whatever, and you came back home in the afternoon, you didn't have time for a proper meal because you were filled with the real meal. <laughs> <laughs> the good stuff, the sapodilly and the sugar apple, whatever was in season, tropical um, plants during that time. We feasted on and we enjoyed it. All right. Um, so my question would be, um, Kendrick, you talked a little bit about wood carving. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about it? Uh, and also the, with the basket weaving, like um, I guess my question would be like, based on the techniques of this basket weaving, how far does it go? Does it go extend back to the Seminoles over here in the Florida region? Is it the similar style and techniques that they're using over there that they're using here? And um, I'm, I'm interested in that, but also the wood carving. Before you mentioned uh, your father taught you a lot of these techniques. Where did he learn these techniques from? So, Well, my father, he had a couple brothers used to work in a straw market, Jacob uh, Wallace and uh, Melvin Wallace. He learned wood carving from his brother, Jacob who passed on, and it was really nice learning the trade, but at first, I couldn't catch it on so quick because my daddy was a little rough, you know? <laughs> so when you get something wrong, he spun you, bam! Yeah, Don't do that like that, get it together. <laughs> so one day, I ran on the side of the yard. He was trying to teach me at first, but I didn't learn. So I just took it upon myself when he went walking for his little walk like he normally do in the morning. I ran on the side of the yard, pick up a piece of wood. The first thing I made was a bone fish. So he going, he say, what you doing in the bog there? I say, carving. And um, I didn't needed a piece of tool. And Wilton that lived right up the road from me, running distance. <laughs> so I ran up by Wilton. I say, 
Uh, well then, I don't want little bone fish in the back. I want surprise daddy when he come. I want show him what they doing. Let me borrow your V pattern tool. That's the tool we use to put all the details, the scales and everything. So he say, man, I like that. I like how you learn in the trade. Yeah, man, I could give you a V pattern tool. So he gave me a V pattern tool. So it's like, all right, let me go in the back of the yard and finish get this together. So when my, when my daddy came back, he was like, what you doing? I say, see, I was making a fish. He say, how come you don't learn when I try to show you how to do it? <laughs> I say, I say, you was being too rough, so I couldn't catch it like that. <laughs> so, then, um, after that, I took the trade serious. I had a, I had a passion for it. I had a passion for the wood carving. And after he seen me really getting into it more and more, me and him started to go in the forest to get the wood. We didn't have no transportation. We, gone, we used to go to a place called Robert Carpet. And it's like a couple miles in the bush, you have to, we call it ramble through the bush. Because there's no track roads, you have to make your own road, probably chop out the pathway. And we towed the wood back on our shoulders for the artwork. And it's a process. So I, I love doing it. I mean, it's a good trade. I have a good passion. I love it. It's a passion I have inside me for it. Then thanks to Ms. Daphne Towns and Sharona Dawes giving me the opportunity to come to Bach and Gola Festival to display my talent all the way from Red Base Bahamas. Wow. Yeah. Basket weaving things really. <laughs> you got it from because yes, I don't know where I got it from. <laughs> okay, no, yeah. So just uh, tell us a little bit about the basket weaving techniques and how do they compare or how similar or different they are from here, the way that they do it in Florida region, or the way uh, over there in the Bahamas. Well, I I learned it from my Grammy. My okay. Grammy taught me how to do it. That's where I learned it from. From oh, she sit under the tent and she lay out everyone and ask everyone who's willing to learn, and that's how I get to learn how to do it from her. Okay. All right. Well, um, to explain basket basket weaving is unique. We'd have to probably show you mm -hmm. um, because, like the Seminoles here or the the Floridians here, they would use um, a similar touch plant that we would use home. We use something called a silver top plant. It's a bit harder than the one that they use. Um, cut it from the forest, stick it on the line, let, let it sunbathe, dry um, naturally in the sun. And um, one part of it, we, you don't discard any part of it. Um, you use the entire middle heart pipe piece of it. You use the entire part. One part is for stuffing or stripping, and the other part is what we call the peeling that overlays the basket. You know, so it's it's really, 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 really unique. It's a unique technique. I knew the Seminole Indians that landed in Red Base because when they went there, they didn't have buckets or anything like that, and so they found a way to um. They created it and molded the bottom of it with and sealed it with either mud or tar. And they used some of that to tow the water back and forth from either the well or use it to as a fishing basket when they went out fishing and other stuff like that. So okay. Thank store you. seeds, rice, um, brush from the cassava, flour, yeah, all those things. Okay, what does it mean to all, to all of you uh, doing, following these traditions that have been passed down to you? How important is it to you? Is it part of your main identity? How, how do you go about it? And how do you reflect on doing all these uh, amazing things that you're all doing, you know, that, that you've learned by, through your families? Well, personally, for myself, yeah. um, when I first, when I first, first, first learned it, I, um, well, it's just a community community thing, just something that we do. But in growing up and learning the history of it, is, it has become a part of me. I have then, since then, then, taught my daughter and my sons them how to actually do it. They don't do it as well as I do it, but they now know the history of it. And like Wilton said before, it teaches you to know where your parents came from, where their parents came from, and their parents came from. because. Um, for both Peggy and myself, we're fourth generation grandchildren of Sammy Lewis, who would have crossed over right. and, and, and lived into Red Bays. You know, so it, it brings back and it teaches you to respect 
the culture and the history of your ancestors. It's the passion that they went through. It also lets you understand or it teaches you, you know, to, to just be in awe of what they went through, what they had to, yeah. So I take it to heart. Well, me personally, um, with the wood carving trade, that helped me to be an independent person. Because like from primary school, I was doing it. I started carving at the age of 10 years old, and I'm 27 years old now. So that's like 17 years. Um, but it helped me to buy my own school clothes. I was buying my own workbooks for school. So my parents never had the strain on them to say, hey, we have to get Kendrick stuff or whatever. I always used to try to be an independent child doing my artwork and taking care of myself like that. So it means a lot to me. It helped me to do plenty of stuff in life. I teach one or two of my friends how to do it, but they get the basics. They were like, oh, this ain't me. That's too hard. I don't know how you turn a piece of wood into something like that. How do you know when to ease up or not to break something? But it comes natural after a while. When you really love something and you have a passion for it, trust me, you're going to get it. Like Peggy here. Um, Peggy has six children. And Peggy's never worked a day in her life. Never worked a day in her life. So um, from sunrise to sunset, that's her job. That's the way she fed her children. She put them through school and all of that. Fortunately for me, I work at the Bahamas Agriculture Marine Science Institute, Bahamsi, in, in North Andros. And so it's kind of different for me than it is for her. That's her way of living. You know, that, that's not just for fun or for anything. This is what she does on a daily basis. This is how she feeds her family, her grandchildren, and everyone else in, in her home. You said the Marine Science Institute. How did you come to work there? How did that start? Um, wow. Bamsi. Bamsi has a slogan that says, grow with us. It's better at Bamsi. And I think myself, along with Peggy's daughter, Lakitra, we, uh, we should be the slogan for Bamsi when it says, grow with us. Because both of us started working on the tutorial farm at Bamsi. You know, they needed some persons to work. Both of us are educated, but because jobs are hard to come by, both of us just went because we wanted to work, not that we needed to work. We wanted to work because my husband is the breadwinner for my family. Um, being from, I guess, that comes from naturally from our background, you kind of want to be interdependent or independent. So both of us, we went to work on the tutorial farm, I guess, with the managers. Um, seeing the potential and what we have and we were I'm now an administrative assistant and she's a senior human resources um, officer at, at BAMSI. BAMSI is mainly the agriculture and marine science like I said Institute in, of the Bahamas. We mm -hmm. um, teach agriculture, horticulture, um, environmental science, all of that. You know, the government of the Bahamas has been really, 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 really invested in that because we need to learn to feed ourselves. Stop being dependent on you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stop being dependent on you guys. And, and um, get our stuff together. And so hopefully we'll be there very, very shortly. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what kind of changes does that mean? Does it like changes in agriculture or, or fishing? Well, both, because mm -hmm. we want to keep the techniques that we were learned by, uh, that we were taught by our forefathers, as well as bringing new technology to both farming and fishing. Mm -hmm. And this is where BAMSI comes into play. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, I, I'm also curious just how, for each of the three of you, how did you first learn about the history of your families and your community in Red Bays of the Black Seminoles and coming from Florida? You know, was it your parents or grandparents who talked about it? And how did you first learn about that? Growing up in Red Bay, is born in, being born into the community, you couldn't duck that. That's something that is naturally taught to you on a daily basis. And so you would see them weaving the basket. You'd ask mommy, daddy, mama, and where did you learn this from? How did you get this? And then they would tell you about Chief Billy, um, Billy Boleg and Cyprio Boleg and um, Sammy Lewis and them and their parents and how they taught it to them. And so it was passed on from generation to generation. And we still do that. Yeah.
So are these uh, histories of these names, you know, Sammy Lewis, your, uh, I guess your fourth great grandfather, mm -hmm. you know, Scipio Bolex, Billy Bolex, are these also taught in schools or pretty much almost just within the families? Um, well, in the families, but the there are some historians in the community of it well, in the bahamas they are now rewriting the history mm. of the bahamas and so these names are now coming into play they're um kind of phasing out not well not phasing out they're well i should say tuning down the arawaks to african and then now bringing the lucayan indians mm. and the seminole indians into the history in the schools wow. and so now it's being taught in the schools and um i i think that's tremendous i think that's awesome that they're now letting people know that, hey, yeah, Massive Point got yeah. its name or where it got its name from and, and all of that, where Red Base got its name from and, or how it became the community of Red Base. So we're phasing, kind of phasing out the Arawaks to Africans and moving more into the Lucayans and the Seminoles. Mm, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so let's see, how do I ask this? Um, so I want to ask, what, what all do you know of, can you tell us about Sammy Lewis' story, about who he is, that kind of thing? Well, I, well, my dad told me, because, okay, his mother, Camila Lewis, she was the daughter of, what's the mommy name again, oh Lord, Joseph Lewis, Joseph Lewis, who was Watkin Lewis, Watkins Lewis, and then um, Watkin was, the uh, older Joseph Lewis, and mm. Joseph was Sammy Lewis, <laughs> Samuel mm. Lewis's son. So it, mm. my dad taught me the history, and he was just like, okay, so um, Sammy had four children, and um, one of them had another four children, and you know, but he gave us the name. He's like, Sammy had four children, which what, which Watkin was one, and then Watkin had four children, and he named his older son Joseph Lewis after his granddaddy, mm. and then. Um, Joseph Lewis had, you know, and, and it went down and on and that. And then my grandmother, who was the third daughter, who was her great-grandmother, mm. um, Camila Lewis. That's how my father and her grandmother got here, and now I'm here. So I was blessed to get mm. my history from Sammy Lewis straight on down to myself. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. I, I, as a kid, when you're hearing about this history, um, just what did that feel like? How, how did you feel about that as a kid? Was it like a sense of pride yeah. knowing this history? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because like I said, I, 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 spent, I spent nine months out of the year in Master Point, which is another settlement about 30 miles away from Red Bays. I would have spent that time there. And so um, I was taught about the history from my Master Point side, which is my maternal um, history and then going into Red Base and knowing that hey, okay, that history has some meaning, but it's not as meaningful as this history. This is the one that you need mm -hmm. to know. It, it brought a sense of pride and a love for the culture, a love for the community, and 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 all of that. And I think when um, Shane Roker, Daphne's cousin, reached out to me and he was like. Oh, cousin, you need to hook up with Daphne. She has um, something going on with the Underground Railroad and um, the Water Railroad and all the water ground, that, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the passageway and all of that. I got excited, and so we hooked up, and that was when Angola and all of that started to come into play. And, you know, we came here, and yeah. How does it feel to have this kind of remembrance ceremony on this side of the, of the water? Ooh, um, when I first went to Manatee Park, for me, it was kind of weird. I didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, this ain't the place I should be. But over time, over the days, I met with Trudy and her husband, and we went through it, and Daphne and everybody else, Dr. Baram, and. Um, Miss Rosalind Howard and all of them, yes. it kind of, kind of made it a little easier to be there. And then um, at the second time when we came over, some of the the ladies in the community that lived around, um, they came and they offered us an apology on behalf of 
you know, their forefathers and everything like that. So it kind of made it easier, although I didn't want to accept that. Mm -hmm. It kind of made it easier, just a little bit easier, because knowing what our forefathers went through, and um, we're all human. And so for you to have to come and apologize for something means that you, uh, you're, you're accepting that you did something wrong to those people, our people. You know, so it was kind of hard, but now it's it's easier because it means that we're being accepted mm -hmm. and appreciated, mm -hmm. and and we appreciate that a whole lot, a whole whole lot. Yeah. Um, How do you feel about being here in the celebration? Um, well, at first it was kind of emotional yeah. when I really heard about the story. He wanted to cry, but me being a male, I just suck it up. <laughs> Can't let the lady see you crying. You know, you look. <laughs> so then um, Miss Tom, she, she just made it more easier for you to understand. You know, she made a booklet and gave you all the information about the history, so that I really appreciate it. And to be here, I um, miss another thing. Because my father used to come and do the Bakhtar and Gola Festival, yeah. Henry Wallace. Mm -hmm. So now I'm in his place. This is my second time coming, but he did the first one. So I really appreciate it, and I feel, you know, appreciated as well yeah, to yeah. be here. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, Kendrick, I want to ask a little bit more about your, your work and your craft. Yes, sir. Do you, I guess, what most inspires your work? How do you get, what do you get most of your inspiration from? Do you have like a? Um, most of my inspiration comes from my father. The way I see him take pride in his work and the way he does his work and he's international, he's international wood cover. He have pieces in the Smithsonian Museum. He have a Kasik Award. So I was like, I want to be like my dad. I want to get there one day and receive them awards and have my pieces displayed all over the world. Mm -hmm. So. I think I'm on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Um, and a few of you mentioned, in, in a, Mr. Mr. Wilson, Wilson as well, how important it is to kind of continue the tradition of teaching your children. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of think that a little bit backwards a little bit. What do you think, or I guess, what do you think have been some of the most important things that your your community, your parents, your grandparents have taught you about your own heritage? To love, uh, to, love to stick together. Yeah. Growing up, they always used to tell you, hey, when you walk into school, don't you come home without your sisters or your brothers. Make sure all of you all come together. If one reach before the other one, you get a beating. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and find them. Yeah, yeah. yeah so they, it normally teaches us how to love and stick together on this unity, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That's, for me, that's that's most important. Family love, family love. Because um, if if there's a piece of bread, one person shouldn't have that. Make sure that all your siblings have that. Make sure you share that. Um, I think that is the most important tradition, and the most important thing that we would have held on to from then. Because um, in the story that Grenad would have written, remember there were 38 of them. Eight of them, mm. you know, survived. So they had to have something to hold on. And I think that is the most important lesson that, we, as as Androsians from Red Base, that mm. we could have been taught. Love, love, yes. unity, mm. sticking together. Absolutely. So, do you guys have any more questions? Um, going back to the educational side, education, and uh, just even like the phrase, the Underground Railroad, um, when were you first introduced to that concept? And were you introduced over there in the Ray Bay? Or was it st through your family that told you about no, Underground? I learned to the Underground Railroad from school. I, learned, I, I, I personally learned of that from, from school. Um, going to history class or social studies or civics class, um, any of the three of them, yeah, that's where I learned it from. And then watching movies, you know, watching the movies and having to go back to school after you were told to watch the movie, having to go back to school and get, um, write your recollection of it, put it in your own words. 
an essay or just a short story or something like that, the folklore, the play, the ring play, and all of those things to bring them back to life. So that's how I learned from it. It didn't naturally come from my family. And then I started searching and piecing it together. It's like, oh, OK, I understand now why this happened, where this came from, and where it's going. And hopefully, my children, after I would have long gone on, um, they would continue to search and look back and see where it came from. Yeah, uh, you know, one thing that uh, I'm thinking about, uh, you've seen, you've gone through a lot of transitions here from where, you know, you got the hi oral histories from your family mm -hmm. members. The education system was transitioning into teach and starting to teach now more about the history side. Mm -hmm. And now we're here in today's time, we're here in the Agola Festival. So you've gone, you've seen a little bit of all yeah. this side. Where do you think, what would you like to take from all this and bring to the next a uh, couple years, like where do you see the next generation, the, the next thing that you want to do with all this information that you've obtained over the years? How do you want, want to see it develop? Hopefully in the next couple of years, um, back home in Red Rays, right. we'd like to see a, probably a historical museum or a cultural center or something displaying um, all of this work, everything from the 1830s, come on up um, right. and you know, it mentioned Manatee Park, the fact that we were here um, at the Angola Festival, that it actually happened, that it just doesn't get lost in history. You know, that some recognition would come to Red Base from it and persons from Manatee Springs and the other um, cultural communities in the United States would come to Red Base and be comfortable enough there to say, well, let me walk into that museum and see what their history link is to my history link. That's what, yeah, we'd want to see. Mm -hmm. So would you say that's that's part of like the dream for, for Red Bay, like what, what you want to see happen there? Is there anything else that, I guess, out of this that you want to see come to your community? A little modernization, but not to take away the cultural aspects of mm -hmm. Red Bay. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that how how big is Red Bay now, or how much has it grown since you all were younger? Well, we're starting off with a population of 30, <laughs> <laughs> 38. We're up to almost 400 oh, per, wow. yeah, yeah. individuals living in Red Bay now. So mm -hmm. it has grown drastically. Um, a lot of the traditional homes have been rebuilt or remodeled, but we haven't lost our, we haven't lost it. You would find that the, um, the camp, the thatch camp, the palm camps are in most of the yards and they're still there. We still build them. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of, I guess, problems do, does the community face? Like what's, um, what, what is everyone's uh, biggest concerns with the community? Is it, is it like modern, modernization, like you said, or? resources or anything like that? Both. Both? Yeah, both. Both. It's f Red Bay's is about 10 miles, 10, 15 miles inland. Mm -hmm. And so um, it takes you about half an hour drive to get to town mm -hmm. to get what you need, to get what you want. Um, we have local petty stores in Red Bay's, but we don't have a fully equipped hospital or yeah. anything like that. And those are the things that we would want to see come to Red Bay's. Mm -hmm. New dockings and um, God help us with that road. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only settlement in the West. Yeah, and it's only the only settlement actually on the west side of Andros. So, mm -hmm. and like, they, they, we still rely on the fishing. We still rely on the farming. Mm -hmm. still rely on sponging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we still rely on those things to feed our families. So. Mm -hmm. That's Not too much modernization, just a yeah. tiny bit. Yes, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I, I read something before about um, people talking about taking the journey back uh, on boats between the Bahamas and South Florida um, as a way of like commemorating the journey. I Do you know anything? Oh, okay. I want to be there, definitely. Yeah. But I mean, um, I know my dad, he's still a fisherman at 68 years old. You know, um, he used to do it. He used to do that um, for a living, from Red Bays to Bimini and from Bimini on to, wow. to South Florida. But nah, age is there. <laughs> yeah. Do you, yeah. Sorry, do you know how long that journey would take? 
don't have any idea. Um, Kendrick, this one's for you. Um, what type of uh, wood carving uh, do you do? What type of uh, figures or, yeah, what are, what, is some, what are some of the works that you've done in the past and, you, and that you're trying to continue to build on? Uh, normally I keep the, the wood carving the native, like, like um, how we have the bone fishing industry in the Bahamas. Um, we have plenty of bone fish guides that, and people even in Florida can come down to do bone fishing and stuff. The guides take them out. Um, I do a lot of sea life, like turtles. Then I make native faces, um, like Indian faces. So I, I normally keep it native in the culture of my wood carvings. Wow. Yeah, is this what's on your necklace? Is this one of yours? Uh, no, I bought this from a lady to the Bakhtan Gola Festival. I was just supporting one of the other artists. I told her it's an artist, so I was supporting her. Do you have any of the sculptures or any of the works in here? Did you brought anything um, for the festival? Yes, so, sir. I, I bought some for the festival. So if you come out there to the festival, you'll be able to see a couple of pieces well. I have there displaying. Excellent. That's awesome. Yes, we, additionally, we have some of And baskets, baskets also. And yeah. Baskets. yeah. That's phenomenal. Not to mention the food we brought. The I am. Yeah. <laughs> tasty. <laughs> tasty. Getting hungry. Yeah. Very tasty. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> yeah. we, Okay, uh, I have one last question. Um, if you want that come for this, you gotta let us know. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with with all of this uh, that we've been talking about in the history and the culture, what what are you all doing, or what needs to be done for the next generation that's coming up to keep these stories um, it needs in to the be culture? Preserved. Mm -hmm. It needs to be recorded like you're doing now. It needs to be preserved. You know. Um, the oral history needs to continue between the generation. The recorded history needs to continue, and books like Grenada, they, they need to continue writing them, you know, so that the history doesn't get, like I said, the history doesn't get lost. That is my worst nightmare day as for this history, the linkage that we've just formed to just die, and nothing happens from it. So. My last question for Kendrick again. Yes, sir. I want to ask about details on your the work that you mentioned that's on display and you know of your father's work. What are, do you have more details about that? What is that exhibit called? Or? Um, my work, my father's work, and my work. Yeah, both. Where okay. can we find you? Yeah, where can we find it? Well, my father, he's way better than me, more professional. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> his pieces look like they are real. You know, like yeah. I saw a iguana he made. A rock iguana, it's like the skin so real and it's ready to crawl off of the wood. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw it in the night, I ran from it, it was in the house. I said, Daddy, what big lizard inside those? He said, stop being crazy, boy, that's the cover they make. When it was in the museum, they sent it back. I said, oh, that look real. So I work in and get into that stage and I'm almost there. Um, but we take a lot of pride in our work. It ain't just about the money, it's the pride which you take in the work. And then somebody will come along and appreciate it, and it'll be very special to them. Absolutely. Kendrick, please let them know that we don't use live trees. Oh, yes. yeah. We don't yeah, use just, live trees. Yeah, just dead trees. We use yeah. um, We use mahogany wood. Then we have a wood called horse flesh, yeah. what they used to use back then to do the rib structure of the sailboats, the boat buildings. We also use that wood. And I have the two of those kinds of wood right over here in me, and those pieces I have. Um, a bone fish made of uh, horse mm -hmm. flesh, mm -hmm. and I have a whole figure, little man with a little backpack on his back, a native Indian, toting some stuff on him. So that's wow. what we do. We don't destroy Mother Nature. No. Yeah. <laughs> don't encourage that. Wow. No. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really, really cool. Well, Even to the sponges. Mm. Yeah. Sponges, we don't. Wow. Destroy. Yeah, the young, the young sponges, they don't yeah. take up, have to mm. be a certain size. Size, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. Well, is there anything else you guys would like to say or to share with, with thank us? Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank we appreciate you, you guys for interviewing us thank today. You. Okay, thank you guys so much. Let's conclude the interview. Yeah.